Right, thanks. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about some code that I developed that corrects for this fuzzy blue stuff above the, the picture of the Earth, which we call the atmosphere. Um, so since pretty much all of my slides has a spectrum, and this is the first astronomy talk, I figured I'd go through what that really means. So the x-axis is wavelength or frequency or color in some way. The y-axis is just how much light you have at that color. And then the spectrum looks something like this, where you have kind of a general shape. And then all these dips are absorption lines caused by various uh, atoms or molecules kind of falling in the way. So in this case, is the spectrum of the star Vega. And the dominant lines you see there are coming from hydrogen. And the smaller ones are coming from various metals. So uh, now I'm going to zoom in on particularly looking at spectra of stars at high spectral resolution, because that's what I know best, uh, and answer what, what can we learn from spectra. So uh, the first thing is we, by, by looking at the, the shapes and depths of certain lines, we can learn what the temperature of the star is. Uh, looking at the depths of almost every line in the spectrum, we can learn about the composition of the star, uh, how much metals it has, how much of other types of um, atoms it has in it, uh, but yeah, by looking at the depth of these lines. And then we can learn about the surface gravity of the star, which is kind of a proxy for what its, its evolutionary state is, uh, again, by looking at the, the detailed profiles of these lines that, that will change as the surface gravity changes. So the, uh, the problem, especially with high resolution spectroscopy, is that the, it's taken from the ground. And so we're looking through the atmosphere, which scatters uh, a good chunk of the light that would be coming from the star uh, away, from, away from the telescope. And that'd be fine if it just kind of scattered everything evenly. Uh, we would just have to increase exposure times accordingly. But it doesn't. Uh, it scatters at very specific wavelengths, depending on what molecules, what molecule in the Earth's atmosphere it hits. So water and carbon dioxide are the most important contributors to this telluric contamination or the telluric absorption. Uh, and then there's contributions from various other molecules as well, ozone and uh, methane, among others. And so what you get is the blue spectrum here is what you would get from space or if we didn't have an atmosphere and is the actual stellar spectrum. And then you, the, the green dotted lines are, what you, are a model for what you get uh, in an actual observation. And so there's a whole bunch of extra uh, absorption lines that are many times deeper than the stellar lines that you want to care about. Uh, and so if you want to measure the depths or shapes of these lines, you have to do something about the telluric contamination. Uh, or else you're going to get the wrong answer. You're going to get a, a line that's way too deep. All right, so the, there's a method to do this already, and that's basically you, you take your science star, and then you, you look at the same air mass, which is the same kind of altitude angle, uh, somewhere else on the sky for a hot, rapidly rotating star, usually. Uh, so the... You have, to, you have to find one of these stars kind of in a relatively tight annulus, and you have to observe it right, uh, right before or right after your science target. And then what you get is something like this, where the, the black spectrum is the, the data, uh, or, or is the, the science star that you want to learn something from, and then the red one is a calibrator, this uh, hot, rapidly rotating star. So the point of the hot rapid rotator is that it's relatively featureless and that all of the sharp features there are actually coming from the Earth's atmosphere. So uh, you can immediately, so you can just kind of divide it out and you remove the telluric absorption. So you get something like this uh, where the telluric lines have been removed and you're left with the, the only sharp features there are actual astrophysical um, absorption lines from the star. So there's a few problems. One, since you're dividing uh, two empirical spectra, you're increasing the noise. So you need to take that into account and, and take longer exposure times, 
than you would otherwise need to get to the same um, single to noise ratio in your final result. Two, it has this artifact from the fact that the, uh, the Telluric standard star doesn't, is not actually featureless. This one's probably the easiest to just ignore because you can, you can computationally kind of smooth over this and remove that division artifact pretty easily. But what I think is the, the most important thing is you're using telescope time for calibration. Uh, what you would like to do is just go from one science target to the next science target and not have to go from a science target to a standard star. Sit on that sometimes depending on your science for longer than your science target and then move on to another science. Um, so there, there has sort of been a way around this for a while and this is uh, the LBL RTM code which stands for line by land radiative transfer model. Uh, and this is a Fortran code that will calculate the, that it knows about the Earth's atmosphere and it, it, you can tell it things about what the, the angle of your telescope is, where you are on Earth, and uh, what elevation you're at, and it'll calculate how much absorption there is from the Earth's atmosphere at, at each wavelength, which is exactly what you want. So if you compare dividing by the Telluric model to dividing by the uh, empirical model, you have less noise, uh, you don't have this division artifact, which again isn't really that big of a deal, uh, and you aren't using telescope time. This is using computer hours, which are much cheaper. So the problem is uh, LBL RTM is not easy to use. Uh, this is a parameter file for it, which I'll forgive you if you don't know what any of this means. Uh, it's a bunch of ones and zeros and things about the starting and ending frequency. And so if you want to use LBL RTM directly, you have to write a parameter file like this. So what I've done is uh, write a code called telfit, which kind of abstracts all of that away. And it lets you write a few lines of Python code to generate a, a Telluric model. And it does all the hard work of interfacing with LBL RTM. So it's pretty much just import the, the modeler, tell it a few things about what the relative humidity is, where you are, what the temperature is, where you are, um, and then the low and high uh, frequency that you want to make the, the model from, and it'll do that for you. Uh, what you're probably more interested in, though, is not just generating a model, but fit, finding the best model to your data so that you can then remove that best model and get at the astrophysical data that you want. So uh, that's really what Telfit was designed for and why it has the word fit in its name. Uh, so it, it follows basically the same process as any fitting code. Uh, you, you initialize it by telling it things like, uh, things, telling it a few things like the uh, altitude angle that you, you know pretty well, don't really need to fit, but you'll ne you need to input that as uh, information for it to know. Uh, you tell it some variables that you want it to fit and give it initial values and set bounds on those. And then you just call the fit method and that has a whole bunch of options that uh, you can ask me about offline if you want. Uh, but lots, lots of options that, that you can change how it's fitting things a little bit. And then it just goes through and, and finds the the best model. So uh, the rest of this talk will basically be looking at uh, how, how good it does on some data. So I have most, uh, most of my data is, is actually of these hot, rapidly rotating stars. So this is an example of that. Um, these stars have very few features, so the residuals should look like noise if we're doing a good job. And so what this plot is, is the, the top panel is the data in black and the best fit model in red. And then the bottom panel is the uh, difference between the two. And so it, it mostly looks like noise even for pretty, pretty deep telluric, telluric lines, which basically tells us that we're, we're doing good. But these are the easiest ones to do because they don't have any uh, sharp features on their own. So there's a few ways that I've, I've gone after trying to do telluric fitting uh, directly on stars that have these sharp features. 
And so for the first couple, I'm putting fitting in quotes because it's doing it in a sort of different way. Uh, so this is an example of one. Uh, it's the same wavelength region I showed you before, uh, but this is of a K-type star, so it's 4,500 Kelvin or something like that, I think. Uh, and you have the, the residuals show all of the, the actual astrophysical features from the star themselves, and the telluric lines have been removed. So the way this, this happened is uh, I still observed an A0 star, but, uh, or which, which is the, this hot, rapidly rotating type of star. Uh, but you don't need to worry as much about the signal to noise because you're not dividing directly by the empirical spectrum. You just need high enough signal to noise to get a good model fit. Uh, and you don't need to worry so much about getting the same uh, air mass as your science star because you can change that in the model. And so you, it pretty much opens up the whole sky and it's easier to find a bright one of these types of stars that you can then uh, use. And then you just find what the, the best parameters, the humidity or methane abundance and all that stuff. Uh, and then you just change the t telescope pointing angle for what's appropriate for your science star and you have a good model. The other one, um, this is stuff I've only done in, in the optical spectra, spectroscopy. And this is for uh, a shell spectroscopy where you have a large wavelength range. And the idea here is basically you ignore the, the fact that the, you don't do any telluric standard stars. Uh, you ignore the lines in the, the source spectrum. And by that I mean a combination of cross your fingers and hope for the best as well as actually you can tell Telfit, don't, use, don't include these in the chi-squared cal calculation. Um, don't use certain wavelength ranges. And then you just find what the, the best parameters are for various wavelength ranges, and you can get a pretty good, good model fit in that way. Um, and again, the residuals are pretty much just the, the source spectrum. And then finally, uh, this is something that I've recently implemented and not really tested, so I'd be interested if anyone does this kind of stuff and wants to try it. Uh, basically, you can directly give it uh, a function that estimates the, what the source, the astrophysical source is. So an example here would be if you're looking at a, a stellar source that you have a pretty good idea what the temperature and, and surface gravity and stuff is. Uh, you, could, you could generate a, a model for that, have that just kind of sitting ready to go, and then you could find the, the radio velocity shift dynamically. So it's going to call this every iteration of the fitting loop, so you don't want to do too much in this code or it's going to slow things down drastically. Uh, but this is probably the most physically realistic way to, uh, to do a, a model fit because you're fitting the source spectrum and the uh, telluric contamination spectrum simultaneously. Uh, so, so instead of kind of doing one at a time, you can do it all at once, and that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, all right, so pretty much in, uh, in conclusion, Telfit, uh, has, I've used it on various instruments for high-resolution spectroscopy, uh, again, mostly for looking at hot stars where it's relatively easy. But uh, I think it's pretty general, and it should, it's, it's been used by a few people uh, outside of, of me and, and University of Texas. And um, yeah, it's, it's recently on uh, PyPy, so you should be able to pip install it, and also it's on, uh, on my GitHub. <laughs> Um, probably, it's not, it, it, it would take some work, uh, a little bit of work, but it, it has a co, it has, one of the things is essentially the, the log likelihood function, one of the methods. Um, it's a hidden method, but you could access it, and then that would be all you probably need for lot MCMC. That would be much less efficient, this already takes kind of half hour or so for uh, a fit, just because it's most of that time is in the actual for the LBL RTM code. Um, it's 
takes a while to, to generate these models. Um, so uh, it's four or five seconds or so per model. So it's short enough that it's not crazy, but if you're doing 10,000 iterations, it gets bad. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I had published a paper on this almost a year ago, I think, um, c comparing that for optical, optical data, and it's, it's very comparable in the, the residuals when you, when you divide the two. Uh, you get errors of a few percent, generally, a uh, few percent of the continuum. So. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I don't have a good way of really knowing how many people or who is using it. It recently went on on PyPy, and I think you can track things on there, um, but you can't really track Git clones, as far as I know. Um, so most of what I know of who's using it is people who have emailed me with issues. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so um, I use it, I have uh, optical spectroscopy that goes from 400 nanometers to 1,000 or so, uh, and then I have near-infrared spectro high-resolution spectroscopy as well from this new iGRINS instrument that was developed at UT, uh, and that goes from 1,500 to 2,500 nanometers. Um, so I... I so, some of the, the data that I showed is from that iGRINS instrument, and it works in the infrared. So, quick follow-up, do you think it would work fine on lower-resolution data? Um, it would. There's one person who's managed to use it for that. You have to go in and change one line of code because it assumes things about uh, high-resolution high and relatively small wavelength ranges to make parts of the code faster. Um, but that's relatively easy. The, the only, th I'm not, totally convinced it's the best way to do it because the Fortran code is still calculating line by line. So you're calculating a really high resolution model and then convolving it down to really low resolution. Um, so there might be a better computational way to do that, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I've considered that. And I'm, I put a little bit of effort into trying to figure out how to do that, but um, I wasn't able to figure it out in a, in a day or so, so I just gave up. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much. Let's uh, give it a hand. Yeah.